Okay. I guess we have to introduce ourselves because Scorbo's not going to do it for us. No, who are you? <laughs> I'll make you do it. Who are you? Uh, I'm Chris Jones. I work on the Windows client team. I uh, work on Windows Vista. I love it. All right. It's great. Build products. Very cool. I'm Jeremy Masner. I'm an evangelist working on Windows Vista, helping third parties to build cool products. So. So, uh, All right. should we start with the moving boxes? Well, you're getting ready for the PDC. We're getting ready for the PDC. Yes. It's big PDC. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe we'll start with that. So I, I was thinking, you know, there's uh, a lot of focus on getting the product out. You know, Beta 1 came out. We're hoping to get see a Beta 2 sometime That's soon. That's right. Hoping to see some Beta Hey, we just shipped Beta 1. We got a little credit. A little bit, yes. It's been, what, credit, like yeah. almost a month, like five weeks since we shipped Beta 1. We already got more built out. Yeah, the world's hungry. Life's good. So why do you even deal with PDC? you got a product to build. Uh, but, the key about Windows is, at the end of the day, Windows is a platform. I mean, that's why we do Windows. We do Windows so people can run apps, and so people can run on their PCs. And if you don't have great apps, we don't have much to say in Windows. So, I mean, our, in some senses, our primary customer is software developers. So the PDC is a huge event for us in, in the Windows team, just generally. It's, it's our chance to really get people not just excited, but informed about what they could do on Windows Vista. Yeah, that's actually one of the things that sticks out when you think about things that are new in Vista. Even the things that are meant for consumers and end users, like all the new stuff in the shell, and yeah. the search, and the organizing, the virtual folders, and all that stuff. That's all a platform also, right? And it's it's not built just for end users. It's built for developers. In, in, in fact, there's actually not much interesting that you can search and organize when you first get a Windows machine, because none of your content's there, and none of the content that any application created is there. In fact, it's like sort of all about content that third-party applications let you create. And so the whole point of Search and Organize is that it's a feature that has a platform component that just gets better as more and more applications use it. The fact that your email program hooks into it can be indexed. The fact that your document it has a format and you write an iFilter driver so the search engine can find it. The fact that you and your application might actually use the search services to improve search in your application or for documents that are interesting for your application. I mean, that's what makes it great is that it consistently appears in every place in applications and the UI and all the content is annotated by developers in a way that makes it easy for the user to see it. Yeah. So let's talk more about the platform. Okay. Uh, everyone at PDC, so th we're filming this video week before PDC. That's right. Uh, if everything goes go well. well. Yeah. <laughs> You're right there. Everything goes smoothly. Uh, attendees are going to show up at PDC a week from today. They're going to get a copy of this poster yeah. hanging up on the board, which is the uh, lighting up on Windows Vista, top 10 developer calls to action. That's right. And uh, I thought it'd be good for the you know, Channel 9 community, people who aren't at PDC, to walk through what those things are and what they mean. Um, although maybe first as a bit of background. You know, how did how did you come up with these things? And, and maybe a you know sort of more direct. How did question. we come up with it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where do they come from? And if if you showed this poster to the product planning designers two or three years ago, maybe even before XP ship, when the first early people were off thinking about what's the next version going to look like, and they saw this poster, would they say that's exactly what we were planning to build, or would they sort of say, ah, a few things changed over the past couple of years? Well, a lot, some stuff changed and, and, and some stuff remained the same. I mean, the, the, the biggest change that you think we'd make in terms of the platform is that WinFS isn't going to be in Windows Vista. At the same time, a lot of the things that we talked about with WinFS, I think about WinFS not just as a technology, but as a vision for how storage should work on your computer. And a lot of those things are in Windows Vista. I mean, the search thing we just talked about, it's about having documents that are annotated, and a property database on, on the side that you can then use to find and manage rich views on top of your data. That's all in Windows Vista. So the whole make an impression pillar that we talk about where you have a way to go and search and find and get your data annotated and visualize it, that, that's all a key part of it. But certainly this whole notion of building on a rock solid foundation and the fundamentals, we've thought about really since Windows XP as a thing that we want to drive hard for developers. And the big shift that we're making in Windows Vista around having a more secure platform where you don't run as administrator, there's a huge set of things that we need application writers to do to really take advantage of that. Not just running a standard user, which we've told people about for a long time, but we're serious this time. I mean, every time we sort of go to PDCs and we say, hey, you should run a standard user, and people go, ah, great, well, we still run as admin, so we're not going to really have our apps work that way. No, this time, we're serious. We're going to have standard user kind of be the default for people. And you can elevate to Kinda? admin. Well, you can <laughs> elevate to admin okay. if you want to elevate. Uh, and 
The problem is when you elevate, it's going to kind of be this awkward experience. And in fact, it's not just going to kind of be this awkward experience. It's going to be an awkward experience. Or and by, so you don't design. want your application to do it unless you really need administrative privilege. And there are all these things that application vendors do, and that in fact, it's not just application vendors. We do in the Windows system, where we write to local machine instead of writing to current user. And it's these kind of simple errors. You open a key for read-write as opposed to just opening it for read. Or you put something in the system directory when you should put it in your programs files directory. All these things that you used to be able to get away with and just have be sort of an error that the system wouldn't catch, the system's now going to catch. And so the burden is on you, the application writer, to go and make sure you don't make those mistakes. Now we have tools and tips and tricks to help. We have app shims so we can make old apps keep working because users really like to have their old apps keep working. But I wouldn't just think about it as something to do, it's something to embrace. You can run a standard user, you can have more security in your application, you can use some of our new tools to help inspect and find buffer overruns, you can call into Security Center to find out whether the firewall's on or not, and ask people to open up ports. There's a whole thing, set of things you can do to be rock solid on the system. And that's something that is just a core pillar of what we need the operating system to be. And then, and then on Get Connected, which is our third leg of what we're trying to do in, in our top ten list. On Get Connected, We've always talked about connectivity and you know sort of the the thing that happened in Windows 95 that moved along through Windows 2000, Windows XP was internet connectivity. But now we're moving into this world of peer-to-peer -peer connectivity, where more and more people connect and program peer-to-peer. -peer. And in in Windows Vista, you have the notion of peer-to-peer -peer and people near me as something that you as a developer can call into. And not only that, but you, if you write sort of an instant messaging service or other things, you can use the people near me service to add value to your instant messaging application. So it's not just a platform for Windows, it's also a way that you can go and enhance the experiences you have for connection. The other thing in getting connected that, that we've continued to drive for is this notion of moving to an XML world where everything that you do, whether it's message exchange with web services, whether it's document formats with our new XPS specification for being able to publish your document in XML, or whether it's the markup in XAML that you use to program the UI in our new Windows Presentation Foundation. You know, all of those things speak to the notion of us just deeply getting to XML as the lingua franca for data exchange, for markup, for document description, and services that help developers. That was amazing. Not a single code word Came out. You got all of the real. I product got all names. the real product names. I know. Well, I, well I, last time I was on, Scoble took all my money because I kept I using long one instead of Windows Vista. So this time I had to be clean. Okay. So there's a lot of money in my beard. Now. <laughs> Second job. <laughs> Just collecting quarters. So why don't, why don't we walk through some of these things individually and sort of talk okay. about the specific things? Sort of. Like we, we went into security a little bit. We can we can bubble up. So the first one up there under make an impression is follow the Windows Vista style guidelines. Yeah. Um, and I can know actually internally as we were putting this poster together, there was a lot of debate about what, what exactly does that mean and what really should developers do. So when you think about asking developers who want to look great on Windows Vista to follow the style guidelines, what does that, does that mean? Well, you, you know, the best example I can give is one that developers know about. You remember when we went, for, and maybe some developers don't know, but remember when we went from Win 16 to Win 32, but we also went from Win 31 to Windows 95, and everybody switched their UI. To this new notion of toolbars, of the gray, you know, the battleship, the battleship gray, uh, which back then was kind of a cool look, but now it's sort of dated. Uh, <laughs> different, different look and feel for your app. That's the same thing we want developers to make, shift develop. We want developers to make now. And the reason we say, you know, sometimes people say, well, why don't you give us the code to make our app do that? Well, most people have their own UI framework already. And what they want to know is how do they update their UI framework or their application to look and feel like Windows. That's the most important thing. And then secondly is their code that they can go in and use. And so of course in our tool sets and others, at, over time we'll make it easy for you to use code to do that. But in the interim you can just go and follow the style guidelines. And they aren't just simple things like how's your toolbar work. It's also things like supporting the new namespace so that you know when you save a document by default that it goes into I know we all really love going to see documents and settings, users, all, use all this stuff. In Windows Vista, it's really simple. See, users, Chris Joe. That's where all your stuff goes. And we've cleaned up the namespace. We want you to expose that cleaned up namespace in your application. Or if you have search in your app, we, we just think there's a common place in the upper right corner where we want you to put search. And here's how it should work, and here's how it should look. And just like in the early days of GUI, you had file, edit, and view. 
and Windows Vista, you have these same sort of, I call them UI keywords or, or marks that you want to keep using in your app. All right, and again, keep our fingers crossed. If all goes well, we'll have some guidelines published. Yeah, PDC. Well, well, you know, and, and even if we don't, most developers are smart enough to go look at what's in the build and say, maybe we should do something like that. So uh, developers just will go and actually, most people I talk to just want to see what we're doing, and then they want to make, some, make sure they have tips and tricks for how to basically emulate or clone. And then we do have some specific controls that were put in to help people look like that. So things like the file dialog, yep. uh, the rich previews, the um, rehosting, the same controls that explore, you know, the shell hosts are available for, for applications too. Right? You can do that, and then you know, a lot of the big pop that comes with with what we call Arrow and and the glass uh, visuals, we just do that for you automatically. So we changed user and GDI and the way that the window manager works to give you the new frames. Now, if you, write, if you write some code that paints your own window, you're actually going to want to do it yourself. So if you just say to user, hey, just give me a window frame, we're going to make that automatically be themed for you. But a lot of people are starting to go write their own window frames now, and so they write custom controls and they do their own window classes. They're going to need to actually call the theming APIs and pick up on theme. And then to do glass, they really want to go and write and get the transparency and translucency that we have and use some of those new capabilities. Yeah. All right. And now I, just, I have my cheat sheet because I can't remember cool. all the stuff. Uh, other things, uh, updates to the common controls, task dialogues, wizards. I and mean, when you think through that stuff, does anything pop out? Is you know, developers should go think about that stuff? Or? We'll walk through most of it at the, at the PC. But yeah, it, it, you know, when we do a, a visual refresh, we think about all aspects of the system: how the start menu looks, how the control panel should work, how a window should work, and you know, not just that, but if you're an application that has you know, tabs in your app, how those tabs should work and navigate. If you do back and next, where those buttons should go. So depending on the kind of solution that you write, you're going to want to do different things. And we, we sort of have some basic premise guidelines for those throughout all aspects, task wizards, uh, control panels, et cetera. All right. is, is Windows Vista only about visual hua, or is there some something for the for the IT guys who is it easier to manage? Is there something for those guys? Uh, you're jumping ahead though in the buckets. So. Oh, well, you know. <laughs> hey, you know yes, That's we'll, my job. I'm the yes, minimizer. Yes, we'll get the, I, the, you know, sometimes people ask questions about, it's a good question. People ask questions about Windows and they say, yeah, hey, you know, is this a consumer release? Or is this for IT professionals or developers or the hardware community? The answer is yes. You know, whenever we do a version of Windows, it's always got something a little bit for everybody. And, it's come sometimes pretty hard for us to do that, but in, in, in the case of IT, we've really made a ton of investments in imaging support for IT, better management support, command line scripting, group policy, and not only that, we've tried to update our best practice guidance for people who write applications. You know, when I go meet with, with corporate customers, a lot of the times they ask me, hey, what's the checklist for, for writing a great application that can be well managed? Because it's great that you did all this stuff, but I want to lock down the application with group policy, and I want to manage that application. I want to get interesting events back from that application. I want to use image based, but I want my images to include the app. So, can those apps be effectively imaged or not? And then I want to, you know, most importantly for IT, the biggest single cost differentiator we'll do for IT is around running a standard user and not administrator. And so when they lock down the desktop, they'll want to know that the app that they deploy can actually run a standard user. And that can actually take cost off the per desktop per year management for IT, which is the line item they're trying to drive down. Uh, back to you. <laughs> so the, the next one up there is uh, enrich the user experience. And I, maybe you can explain how you differentiate enriching the user experience and, and using WPF from this style guideline stuff because they sound a little similar. Yeah, I, you know, the way I think about it is, you know, there were the people that, and again, I'll use a Windows 95 analogy, there were the people that used control 3 dv 2dll and just sort of got their application to look, and that's what I'll call getting over the minimum bar for visual effect. It really means that your application doesn't look dated. It looks like a modern app. And then there's doing things where you actually take advantage of the fact that we now have a fully hardware accelerated new model that integrates text, video, and 3D. And can you build a new, richer experience? Now, I know in the case of our next generation of Office, we're doing a ton of things to try to rev up presentations and charts and data to use new 3D visualizations to just give you a, a better and a more immersive experience with your app. And that's what we try to talk about with sort of enriching the user experience. It's not just following the look and feel guides so your application can be usable. 
and fits in with the rest of the system. It's also thinking about how do you use the new graphics capabilities to give people a, a richer and sort of more tangible experience where you feel almost like you could reach forward and pull the model around if it's an Excel chart or pull through the slides if it's a presentation or in the case of, of media applications really play full glitch free high definition video and audio. Um, so it's a, it's a level of depth and I don't, and again, I don't think it just applies to, you know, certain people think about this as, okay, well, if I'm not doing photo editing or I'm not doing media editing, that's not for me. It's for anything you might do where you're trying to richly display in a graphical sense data. What, what do you think? Is there a good example that people will see in the box, you know, what, what in the box, with the building about a PDC, if they wanted to look at an example of an app that was really sort of moving forward on that rich presentation, <coughs> which one would you have people look at? Well, I think there's some things that, I mean, for me, there, there are a couple of things we're going to talk about. We definitely, we have a program that we have written internally as an incubation, which is uh, written all in our new presentation uh, foundation, also using the new communication foundation as well. Um, and that application that you'll see really does give you some sense of how to use visualization, where you can do 3D views of photos, you can rearrange and navigate through pictures. So that, that gives you sort of a full experience sense on the manage side or written to the framework. On the Win32 side, I really would look at Office as an example of that. I'd also look at the built-in experiences we have around photo management and music to get an example of what it's like to do sort of a next generation visualization app. And then if you want to do, you know, go to the inbox games, I mean we even rev Taipei <laughs> to have new tiles that cascade and fall down and, and, and it's the same game but it just feels like it plays differently because it's again got that sort of 3D context and it, it, it feels more lifelike in the way that you interact with it. Okay, great. And then rounding out that bucket of making impression is the visualize, search, and organize. Uh, we talked about that before to kind of kick things off. When, when you think of what specifically you'd like developers to do around that, what are the, what are the top couple of things that come to mind? Well, the, the most important thing you can do as a developer is make sure that your data type, whatever it is that's been created, has an eye filter on top of it. And that allows the search engine to actually index it. And the nice thing about allowing the search engine to index it is it, it works on Windows Desktop Search for existing systems like Windows XP as well as works for Windows Vista. So you write this iFilter and it's a nice reusable piece of code that makes the data be exposed on down-level systems and on full new versions of Windows. And in fact, it's even more because the Office SharePoint uh, system uses it, the MSN uh, desktop search uses it as well. And, and many, iFilter's a good thing. iFilter's a good thing. And, and many people have been using iFilter like things, I mean, it's been a content indexer for a long time. So it's a, it's a long-standing interface that we've just adding more and more ways that people can interact with it and use it. The second thing I do is make sure that you're writing interesting properties to your documents. I mean, that there didn't used to be a reason to go put properties in your documents because nobody ever searched for them. They just sat there dormant. And now that we create views in the shell using those properties, well, the more of those properties you put in and the more accurate they are and the more you can auto-populate them for users. Putting up dialogues where you ask users to type in properties, not super effective. Automatically figuring out from the document what properties are interesting to populate really helps people find the information that they're looking for. Um, and then the third thing I do is I just make sure that you, you know, this gets back to sort of being a well-behaved application. Put your data in the right place. Save it to the default document space um, because then it'll get found and picked up and it can be migrated. It'll work and be cached offline in the case where you're using remote document folder that's sitting on a corporate server. All these things just work. Now, if you want to go a step beyond, the next thing to do is to actually incorporate search into your application. Um, so the basic thing you have to do there is use the standard file open dialog file open and file save because that gives you through file open you get the virtual folders that users can use the same folders that they're using to browse in the shell they also appear in the file open dialog box so it's exactly the same experience and if you're not using standard file open uh, you know when you file open from your app you're going to get the hierarchy and you won't be able to say show me <coughs> more documents and show me documents where the author's journal yeah. you can do that in our standard file open and similarly with file save we automatically put a template where it's easy for the user to enter properties if they want to do that and for you to pre-populate. So file open, file save, key. The next thing to do is to actually incorporate search in your application. So if there are things, if you're in an application that does photo management or you're in an application that does document management or you're in an application that just does anything with search, even you know, like an, an application like uh, personal finance management, even if you don't search the file system, 
use the same user experience model in place and in the system so because people are going to start to be used to this notion of oh I go to the upper right to search for things in the context of my app or my experience yep um, probably so many things you could sort of rat hole I'll, I'll do one quickly because I know you're going to take me down one rat hole uh, yeah common <laughs> file out like I, people here talk about it a lot and they're excited about it and I, I think maybe one of the reasons is that it's surprising how many commercial applications don't use the file open dialog today yeah. Uh, and they've gone off and built all their customizations. So I don't, I don't know if you, I don't know how much into that rat hole you want to go about what we've done to respond to that feedback and why people can actually use the common one now. Well, the, you know, in some ways, of course, we're our own worst enemy because Office hasn't used the common file dialog, and so it's created this notion that there are so sort of two different experiences. And one of the things we've tried to do, and that was because in the Windows organization, we didn't do a good job of building a file dialog that could really be customized for the need that you have. Plus, there. What's the value in using the Windows one? Well, now we think we've addressed the customization issue, so you can add the right customization for your application's experience. But also, the virtual folders thing changes how people want to look for things. And if you don't support, and it's not something that's easy to write yourself. It was easy to write a file browser before. It's not easy to write a virtual folder browser. Virtual folders are their own animal. So it's it, the value proposition for the developer, I think, has changed quite dramatically from what it was in Windows XP, Windows 2000, Windows 95. It's just you get a ton of benefit, and we've addressed the major hurdles that people had for getting over with, with, with follow up. Okay, good. That was one right. We won't go down anymore. Oh, come on. Uh, so let's see. So the next column is uh, be rock solid. Yeah. And we talked about run talk securely. About secure. I think you gave some good good guidance there. Yeah. Um, I, maybe just one last thing to hit there, and then we'll go on to the reliability and manageability stuff. Okay. Do you expect that applications are going to need to elevate often, or should they not? You, you sort of mentioned that it's going to be a goofy experience, and that's a little bit by design, in, in the same way that when you do something dangerous in IE, you get right. the gold bar. Do you want, I mean, how, how many apps do you think are going to need to elevate or should need to, to elevate? Most apps should. I mean, you know, why, why do you need to elevate? You need to elevate if you're doing things like changing system state for all users, which most apps shouldn't need to do. You only want to do that per user. You need to elevate if you're doing things like uh, registering an object machine wide that anybody can get access to. Again, you should only need to do that if you're an administrator. That's pretty rare. So an app install it's pretty likely you'll have to elevate. But if you use MSI, you get the elevation basically, quote unquote, for free, because MSI knows how to request the system, ask the system to go to the elevation. If you use your own packaging solution, you probably got some work to do, because you're gonna have to go and request the elevation and mark your app to say, hey, mark the setup program to say, run elevate. Once you're installed, during runtime, Standard user has good permissions on the system. They can write files to their per user directory, they can go and connect to shares, they can do all the things you need to do. So unless you're doing some deep system groveling stuff like you're a firewall, you're an antivirus program, you're a kernel level service, you're a system wide service, I mean those things you probably do need to run with administrator privilege or some higher privilege. The rest of the stuff you should just be able to run as standard. Really it's Really, it's the fact that people make simple mistakes that causes them not to be able to. And that's why it's possible for us, frankly, to shim a bunch of the existing applications. Because, you know, the app says, I need this key for rewrite. And we look at the app and say, oh, you only need it for read, really. You just asked us for read write. So we open the key for read and we tell the app the app got it for read write. Done. The app runs. It's, you know, running as a standard user is more complex than something that most developers still don't do right, which is check Windows version. Almost like, you know, 20% of our app compat issues, almost any time, like, we change the Windows version and anywhere from 20 to 40% of apps break until we put in the Windows version check ship because ISVs write the code that says if Windows version equal X, then run, otherwise don't run, instead of if it's greater than or equal to X. We, just that simple thing needs to be changed. And so we'll have enforcement in the system, we'll have rules and coaching, but it just shouldn't be that hard. There's no reason to do it. Unix has had this for a long time, and you can run lots of apps on Unix and not be root. You should be able to run your app on Windows and not be admin. Yeah, we'll have the good tools also. The uh, Now I'm going to lose track of the code names. UAP predictor tool, is that what we're calling it? Uh, they, they can look and just say, hey, you're opening HKLN, or hey, you're opening uh, even an HKCU uh, for 
for write privileges this, and you shouldn't do that. This goes to our continuous feedback loop and, and point. You know, one of the things we've done in the system is actually instrument some of the common things that happen. So we're going to start to get reporting back for applications that actually want to call into us. Uh, and so if an app calls to try to open a key read write and that key read fails, we actually do a little what we call squim log and we actually instrument that back. So we can start to go send reports to ISVs and say, hey, your application seems to be calling a lot of these things, you should go fix it. Or we can go write a shim for that app and deploy it through Windows Update so the application actually just works. So you know, we're really benefiting from the notion of a continuous feedback loop in these common places where we see failures because we can start to report and heal the system. All right, just, just because you mentioned Squim, we may as well mention the privacy policy because you talked about right. sending data yeah. back to Microsoft. So We always, you know, we, you, you probably know about it as a customer improvement program, but it's an opt-in program where people opt in to send us data. It's not user or machine identifiable. We put it, we put it together in <coughs> aggregate. We don't share the information with anybody else. And it really is designed to help us fix common problems in the system. Let's take another example of what we've done in, in Windows Vista. We actually have the ability to log when... You know, you know, you ever get frustrated and your application doesn't go into standby when you, or your laptop doesn't when you close the lid? Mm -hmm. Most of the time it's because a third-party device driver or a third-party application refuses to go into standby. So we actually log that failure and report it back to Microsoft in the event that you've opted in for a customer improvement program. And that allows us to go track which applications and which device drivers prevent standby. And then we can go and actually work with those vendors to fix theirs so that your experience as a customer improves. That's another place where we're using this notion of feedback. This is a pretty good segue into reliability because one of the other things we do, if I understand it right, for specifically that that scenario is uh, we'll actually no longer in Vista allow apps to veto the standby. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a change. Right. If, if an app says I don't want to stand by, we'll, we'll say interesting. <laughs> we're going. We're standing stand by. <laughs> so, and and you know the same is true for for end app. You know how many times have you shut down your system and a dialog box comes up and says, you know, it's trying to shut down blah.exe. Wait or what? look, shut down, it's done. I said I want the system to be done. And so apps have really got to respond to that or we'll just shut them down. And then now that's in the case when the user wants to shut down the system. For standby resume, well-behaved apps, it works most of the time. But these edge cases really make the customer experience be bad. Yeah. So let's talk about some other stuff in that, in that uh, design for reliability and manageability bucket. And yep. then, I mean, maybe getting back to, to Robert's point. Um, I, what? We don't have a whole lot of time to get through the rest. Okay, yeah, we should go quick. So, uh, Top things you want developers to do for reliability and manageability, and I guess that means both reliable for end users and reliable and manageable for the IT. Uh, uh, also. Yeah, very short list. Use a good installer, you know, either a Windows installer or click once. Uh, and I, I know there are a ton of great third-party solutions that actually build on top of Windows installers. So those are great too. Yeah. But use a good installer technology to make sure your app can install and uninstall cleanly. Uh, and then um, make sure that you support no restart or no reboot APIs. Too many times. You know, when you update your application, the user gets asked to reboot their system. There's no reason for you to do that. So we have APIs in the system that allow you to sort of freeze dry your app and resume it back if you're getting updated or if a component's updating underneath you, which means you have to do a system reboot. So support those things. Uh, interruptible APIs for file access, for network access. You know, how many times have you gone into a situation where your network goes away and the app hangs? Well, it's because we didn't provide APIs to go and make it so you could have interruptible file read and file write. So use the interruptible APIs for file read and file write. That means your app won't hang when you have a network failure or some other thing happening in your, in your system. Um, and then manageability, use lightweight event tracing, crimson event logging, which is our, our updates to that. WMI for instrumentation, there's just a basic set of things. Group policy, we talked about those before, that really make it easy for the IT professional to manage your app. Yeah, and actually, just one, I know we're short on time, but another fun thing actually is parental controls, which is sort of group policy for the home. That's right. But the parent user. And for, is, for, people, for people who are targeting solutions to the home, parental controls is going to be big. Another reason for us to get to standard user. It's hard to parental control an admin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm dealing yeah. with that with my son. Right? Yeah, yeah, bad. <laughs> At some point, they throw the switch and they control you. It's the, it is parental control, the teenager controlling the parent. <laughs> so we got to be careful of that, too. All right, so let's, uh, we'll do a, a quick finish up on the customer feedback loop. Uh, we talked some about how Microsoft uses it. If you had one specific request for ISVs around uh, establishing their own customer feedback loop. I, I, I'll divide it into two. Use the vendor portal. We have a resource where we capture tons of crash information and other reliability problems. And if you sign up for the vendor portal, we can actually provide that information to you to help make the customer experience be better. And the second is have a feedback loop of your own. 
I mean, this whole notion of connected software with service is something you can really embrace, and tons of solutions have done that. You don't need that. Microsoft doesn't need to be involved. Just have a customer feedback loop where there's a way for your customers to interact to and respond with you. So a little bit of customer feedback loop is like UI style guide. It's a way of life, and there's some code to help you implement it. You got to embrace the way of life to really live it. It's not just the vendor portal. All right. Uh, so the last bucket is get connected, and we talked a little bit about the, the broader bucket of, of connected systems. Yeah. Uh, again, when you think of sort of specific technologies to use there, what, what do you recommend developers go look at? Uh, you know, for the most part, I, I think that, that building for, you know, having a, a fabric where you're able to expose your application or your solution as a web service is a critical inflection point, and for some set of apps, you want to go do that. So. Being able to use Windows Communication Foundation and actually connect your application with other applications, exposing through XML web services, that's important. If your website, RSS, is a key way to go get connected, we have a great RSS platform. Don't just think about that as web content or HTML pages. Pictures, calendar items, anything you want to distribute on off of your website, you can distribute in an RSS feed. We've got a great platform solution for that. Exposing your data in our XML file format or any XML file format. You know, Office is doing both. Office's file format is moving to native XML. That's their implementation. And they're supporting XPS, which is our extensible paper specification. That's the way to go and share it in a sort of application-independent way so that you can have readers that look at it. So exposing your application's data through XML. And then lastly, I'd really pick on peer-to-peer this notion of personal connection and thinking about how to, how to bring those things together. Um, one other thing to think about in, in connected systems is mobility. You know, over 50% of the machines sold now are laptops, so you've really got to think about power management, battery life, uh, being able to operate in loosely connected networking states, the interruptible file APIs I talked about. But there are some things to do where your application can be mobile aware, and I really encourage developers to think about that. You know, and we all know what it's like to have a poorly behaved application on your laptop. It's the one that never goes to sleep, sucks battery life, and has network latency issues. And you're just like, God, this just sucks. It's so bad to be on the airplane and have this kind of application experience. So just make sure your app really, really thinks about those things. So maybe, maybe let's talk a little bit about that last one, the mobility. Um, so, you know, we've got a, a couple things. We've got the power management, uh, power awareness APIs. So there's some new stuff with, with the BIOS for, for quick hibernating and resume. Yep. There's the network location awareness. There's the ink and gesture support. When you think of how all those things fit together, I mean, what, what kind of apps do you envision and how, how people would use their laptops differently maybe with, well, I with think a great Vista app? Uh, I think it's two, there are a couple things. In, and in each of these areas, we've got sort of the basic cost entry and then the exploitive. <coughs> basic cost entry is be a well-behaved application on the system. Battery life, power management are the key thing, and network latency awareness. Those are the key things to think about for your app, just to make sure that when you're in low battery, maybe don't play those animations because you don't want to spend the CPU time and the GPU time to go paint the screen. When you're in a network latent state, Maybe you should use the offline cache rather than having to try to connect back to the network or know that you should throw out a network utilization. So thinking through just some basic things to do and you're right, we have APIs in the system that help you. Um, and being well behaved on standby and resume, which we talked about before, that's key. Then on exploitive, you should really think about is your application something that would really work well on a tablet where inking and gestures. Anything that's a form entry app is a classic example of this where you want it to be easy to people to just interact with the thing with the pen. Uh, and using ink as a data type in your application is, is a nice feature to have uh, for those cases. And we think you know, increasingly as we move forward with Windows Vista, we'd like to have more and more of those laptops have that ink capability. And so you'll see more people have the ability to take advantage of that light up feature. Okay. Yeah. So uh, put, put all this together. What does success look like for Vista? I mean, how, how will you know that you've done a good job building the product and that you know, we've done a good job at PDC if you look a year or, or two years out? Well, I mean, the first success point is the PDC. And did we really get the content right? And do developers really get what they need from Microsoft? And, you know, every PDC, that's our assessment. Uh, and really, I'll look at success at this PDC as, to, as what we laid out as a sort of vision in 2003. We took all the feedback and came back in 2005 and said, here's the product. And not everything's there. We've addressed some of the issues that developers raised in 2003, and I think we've got a great solution that really responds to a lot of the needs. But that feedback will come from the community that's coming to the PDC and as we sort of look beyond it. So that's criteria one. Now criteria two for me is going to be that we have a beta two 
that we ship of Windows Vista <coughs> where IT is rolling it out and customers are rolling out in broad use and we get great feedback on the beta too. So not just from developers but also from all customers because our, the success is tied together. You got to have a nice blowout operating system release to create enough opportunity for developers to want to target it. And then you've got to have an easy way for developers to participate in that wave along the way. Um, success number three for me is that not just Vista, but Windows itself as a developer platform gets better. And that's why we've done some things like with the .NET framework and WinFX, make them available down to existing Windows systems. Look, our job is to serve the Windows developer. Part of the way we serve that is through unique new things on new Windows versions. But part of the way we do that is to provide them with tools that allow them to build applications that run on existing Windows versions too. So we want to make sure that we've got the nice balance of both. And I, I really think with Vista and with the work we've done on WinFX, we've done that. We've been able to create that balance. Um, you know, my, my dream is at Vista launch a year from now, hundreds of applications that light up on Vista, new machines that are there in a, in a, in a super holiday season plus a super corporate season where we're rolling out both of those things. And then a year later for people to say, wow, why would I buy an application that's not a Vista lit up application? I mean, that, that's sort of my dream. Not just because everybody will write to Vista, but because there's so much value, I think, in what we're providing that customers and developers will naturally choose to embrace both. Is there going to be a premier Vista app that Microsoft is building or Microsoft is helping a developer build to really showcase these 10 principles? I think that the, the thing that's... You know, what we've learned is there's no one size fits all. In fact, I don't think any application will do all 10 of these things. The thing you have to do is pick segments. So, you know, what's going to be our premier Win32? I have a big Win32 code base. What do I do? I think Office 12 will showcase some of that work, and you'll see that as an example. And I talked about some of the internal solutions we build in Windows as other places that that gets showcased. On a website, it'll be quite different. So we are working to try to come up with two or three websites, and if you know some, we want to talk to them and get them to really light up, particularly with the RSS support, the new work that we're doing in IE7, targeting and, and embracing the kinds of things that you can do. In managed, uh, I think it's going to be as much sort of these new incubations we're doing, but that's where you're going to start to see a lot of new apps be written. Right. Uh, and I think that, again, you'll start to see the PDC as a place where we see a couple of those, but we really want to be working with the development community to have great applications available. And then there's you know corporate line of business where I think that 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 feedback cycle is really one around people using the .NET framework today, moving to use WinFX and use new versions of the .NET framework that we released this year. So let's hit a couple more things real quick. Uh, some interesting comments on your last Channel 9 video. Yeah. Uh, there you got feedback? Some, there was some deep <laughs> parsing about what exactly you said about the presence of WinFX yeah. in Windows Vista. And yeah. you want to uh, maybe say it in a way that doesn't require pages and pages of comments to figure out. No, yeah. WinFX is part of Windows Vista. It's, it's, in, it's in the system. Uh, the first time you install a WinFX application, you're able to just go and run and use it, and if the bits are just on the disk and not actually installed, we'll gracefully install them for you and you're off to the races. So you can count on WinFX being there if you're uh, writing an application. Now for existing systems, you're going to have to go figure out how to download it. We're actually trying to work in combination to make that a lot easier, but for Vista, we're there. All right. And then uh, one last thing, maybe talk about sort of where you're going to be at PDC or, or where you're not going to be at PDC because we had, you and I obviously, I have, we, we've talked quite a bit about this talk, Fundamentals 200, where we're going to do exactly this, walk through the top around. 10 at PDC and uh, as of right now, again, it looks like we might actually not do that. So yeah. if you want to sort of explain what, what happened there. Well, we got a ton of great feedback on the talk and the concept of the talk, which is credit to you and to the work that we've done on the top 10 list. And what we found out is that there was so much interest we wanted to put it in a general session. And so we actually have it as one of the, the general sessions that Jim's doing. And after Jim got done looking at the content and getting his talk together, there wasn't much left for you and I to talk about, which uh, allowed us actually to create this nice opportunity for people to do a lap around, around the Windows Communication Foundation. And there were some other highly rated talks we were able to reorder. So the net is there's enough excitement around the talk that we just basically combine it with Jim's, and most of Jim's talk is going to cover what we're going to do. All right. Where, where is the... Windows Vista needle right now. In like, what sense? One out of ten. <laughs> how, how much have we seen of it? I, you know, people are keep, keep writing me on my comments. You know, why should I care? Why, why should, should you I know? Care? And, should and every week we're starting to out come out with it. come out with more. I, I I'm finding I'm getting more excited by going around the company and interviewing people. 
it's finally within the last two weeks that I've been like, wow, I'm really excited about getting Windows Vista now. Yeah. Where two weeks ago I was like really actually pretty demoralized, right? The funny the funny thing about it is, I, I don't know if people remember Windows XP Beta One, but I remember Windows XP Beta One, and people just said, "Where's the beef?" I mean, basically, they just said, "Where where is this thing?" And then Beta Two came around, they're like, "Oh, there it is." Same thing, you know. Windows Vista Beta One is way more stuff than Windows XP Beta One was. And Windows Vista Beta 2 will make Windows Vista, Vista Beta 1 feel like XP Beta 1. It's going to be that kind of difference. And the reason that happens is because we start sort of at the base of the system where you can't see much. And then it's easy for us to add stuff on top and so you start to see that cascade and come out. So, you know, I, 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 people ask me, what's new in Windows Vista Beta 2? And I say, well, let's not talk about anything other than you haven't seen photo management, music management, or the new version of Media Center, or the new version of Tablet. Let's just start there. And then, let's go and say, the shell wasn't really done yet, we don't have the arrow look done, we didn't have the window manager done, so you could actually alt-tab between windows and see full screen previews of the windows. I mean, right there you've got a ton of work yeah. that you would, you know, XP never had any of that stuff at the level that we're putting it in. So I, I feel quite good about where we're at with Vista Beta 1. I just think that every build and every release is, is going to get better. Um, the other thing is that you know, we have... People, have, there's been this real hand wringing. Are we going to have a build for the PDC or not? Going to have a build for the PDC? What are we going to do? And we have a build for the PDC 5219. Is it? Uh, and the interesting thing about it is, it's only like six weeks after we ship beta one, and it's got all this new cool stuff in it. And so people go, wow, you know, you, I think, wow, six weeks after beta one, we got another build that's got all this stuff in it. That's just another step towards beta two. That feels good to me. So I feel like we're, you know, 70% through the features, yeah. but like 30% through the visible features. Because yeah. the, it's the last 30% where you add the frosting on the cake that makes people really see the product come together. Well, and Joel Spolsky said, uh, has talked about that several times, that most people don't believe something's changed underneath until they see the UI. Yeah, no, change, that's right. right. That's right. Like, like we, we have a, an entirely new networking stack. Yep. I've interviewed that team. And the performance gains they're seeing are incredible. Yep. You know, we're, we have a whole interview with them. We, we have, have the new, new super. We have the new super fetcher so the, for performance. We have the new audio stack, the new networking stack, the new video stack underneath the system, the new presentation foundation, including the window manager, including the work that we've done to make the graphic stack be nice. We've got some new enhancements in the kernel for reliability and tracing and fast S4, which is the standby resume one to two seconds work we're talking about. I mean. It's just a lot of good stuff in this. And there's system. a bunch of stuff from the tablet team. I yep. just interviewed them. Yeah. Who else? Who else should we interview? <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I got five more interviews this afternoon. <laughs> and we should just, well, we have a little bit of time here yeah. before we talk about who else to interview. Yep. Uh, what's the best way? Uh, let me say this. How do how do you reach out to the developer developer community, and where do you look for feedback? So if uh, if the developers at PDC or what Channel Nine have some feedback and they want their voices heard and considered, where do they put it so that you you see it and consider it? Well, the first thing to realize is that, I, I mean, I, I probably should say this for my job security, but I don't do the work. People on the team do the work. And so the, the, the thing that we do is try to make sure that developers are interacting with the real people engaged in building the problem. People like Chris Anderson, people like Dean Hakovich on the IE team, and Chris Wilson and folks working there. And so my number one thing for developers would be the best way to interact with Microsoft is to interact with the people on the teams doing the work. And in each of those teams, we've got blogs and communities and other things, and folks will be down at the PDC. Look, if you want to interact with me, there's easy ways to find me. Just mail Chris J.O. and say, hey, Chris J.O. at Microsoft.com. Here's this, here's that, here's the other thing. And I look at that. I also troll through the news groups and look for different information or facts or tips and tricks. But you know, for the most part, my approach is to try to make sure that everybody working on something in the company is deeply connected with the community that cares about their work. I mean, that, I think, is the thing that really makes a difference in what people do. And if you had someone on your team come back to you and said, look, I was at BDC, or I was you know, reading Channel 9, and the community really said we have to do this, you know, we hadn't planned for this work, but I think it's worth doing, that you sort of accept that and say, yeah. Well, that's part of our customer feedback. I mean, you know, why would we do a PDC otherwise? We're not going to invite a bunch of people to hear what we've done and get feedback to just disregard the feedback. We take it quite seriously. And in fact, a lot of the things that you'll see in this PDC are directly responses to what we heard in the 2003 PDC, both at the micro level and the macro level. 
know, we've heard people say, wow, you know, we love WinFX, but we got to have a little bit more reach for WinFX. And we decided to make parts of WinFX available to existing systems so it was easy for developers to do that writing and authoring. So, you know, we really, we, developers are customers of ours, and, and we think that they, as I when we started this conversation, the soul of Windows is allowing people to run applications. People don't buy Windows just to run Windows. It's, we love it. It does lots of stuff. It's just not as interesting on its own as it is with great apps. And if we don't build the right platform, we don't get the great apps. Yeah. Simple as that. Seems cool. like a good place to end. Yeah. Thank you All very right. much. Hey, well, thanks. I know you guys are busy. I appreciate you taking the time to come by. Yep. Have fun at the PDC. Don't thanks. burn yourself out taking too many videos. <laughs> it's not